Hello, my name is Christy Roman and this is my application presentation for Psychology 2510. The topic of my presentation is the problem of events, why are people so easily offended and what is the solution? First of all, we need a quick definition of offense. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, offense is annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. It often involves hurt feelings, often because someone has been rude or shown no respect. But offense is more than that, though. The negative effects of offense are often cumulative. They can build over time. They are also collective. Offense often escalates in groups, leading people to take part in protests, riots, or even insurrections. Some people actually make a living by being offensive. Harboring offense can have negative impacts on both physical and mental health. Holding a grudge or clinging to unresolved feelings of resentment or anger can cause emotional stress, anxiety, and depression. Offense can greatly affect interpersonal relationships. It can lead to familial dysfunction, abuse, neglect, and divorce, or just unhappiness in general. Who wants to be or be around a bitter, angry person all the time? Offense even impacts society in general, leading to social, political, or religious disagreement and discord. When whole countries or their leaders become offended, it can even lead to war. There are many reasons why people are offended. But many social psychologists and sociologists agree that people are more easily offended these days and that this hypersensitivity to offense and its prevalence in society is a serious problem. So what's the solution? How can we avoid being offended? And if we can't, how can we combat the resulting negative effects of taking offense? Some common current solutions when we choose to seek them are counseling, medication, herbal and alternative medicine and therapy, relaxation techniques such as yoga, meditation, aromatherapy, and others, or even roundtable discussions, town halls, debates, and mediation. So what's my solution? Well, it's forgiveness. Now wait a minute. I know you're probably wondering how a concept like forgiveness can be applied to a real social problem like offense. Well, I'll get to that in a couple of slides, but first it's necessary to understand what forgiveness is and what it's not. Don't worry, if forgiveness is a topic that conjures up images of people going into a church, confessional, seeking to have their sins forgiven, it's much more than that. Surprisingly, the definitions of forgiveness from psychology and many religions are very similar. That means that forgiveness can be a practical solution that nearly anyone can apply, whether they're religious or not. One psychological definition of forgiveness is a conscientious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. In the Christian New Testament, the Greek word used to denote forgiveness is ephesis, which means dismissal or release. Forgiveness means dismissing a debt, releasing another from blame, putting the event in God's hands, and moving on. According to Nick Wignall, clinical psychologist, and many other counselors, pastors, and teachers, forgiveness is not, and this is probably the most important part, forgetting. Forgive and forget is a lie. Sometimes it's impossible to forget what someone did to hurt you. We can remember the offense while still choosing to forgive. Endorsement. It's not approving of what someone did or saying the offense was okay or no big deal. It's not minimizing, excusing, or justifying the offense. Reconciliation. 
Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same. Reconciliation implies the restoration of a relationship. You don't need to tell your offender that you forgive them, or spend time with them, or even agree with them. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's not one decision. Forgiveness is not a one and done event. We may have feelings of resentment or anger that linger long after the event. And when those feelings well up, we must forgive again and again. Forgiveness is a way of life. So now that we know what forgiveness is and what it is not, how can we apply this concept to the social problem of taking offense? First, we can start by educating people. We can educate ourselves and we can educate others. According to psychologists and theologians alike, popular sayings such as forgive and forget may actually prevent someone from being able to let go. We can also tell others how the habit of forgiving has changed our lives, if it has. We can model forgiveness behavior, being a positive role model for others. We can use slogans and social media to influence others. We could even use social media to start a social movement. Hashtag forgiveness could become the new trend. So how does this pertain to social psychology? Most people want to be thought of as kind, empathetic, and forgiving individuals, yet many of us harbor long-held grudges, especially against ex-spouses, parents, siblings, or even grown children who have offended us. This creates cognitive dissonance in which what we believe is the right thing to do or believe conflicts with how we actually behave or believe. One way to start is to simply make the decision to forgive. Some people may cave to social pressure and appear to forgive on the surface to maintain a positive self-preservation. In fact, social psychological research has shown that in some collectivist cultures, people may choose to forgive to preserve social harmony. But according to the social psychological theory of insufficient justification, if we behave in a certain way long enough, eventually we might change our attitude to match our behavior. If taking offense and holding grudges is the norm, first we must be willing and courageous enough to break social norms. But in order to really change our behavior, we must change our attitude. Attitudes are changed through persuasion. To persuade ourselves and others to change, we must ensure the message is received and understood. Because the topic of forgiveness is both personal and relevant to nearly everyone, the central processing route should be used. That means the message must be supported by strong evidence and good reasons or good motivation for the attitude to change. Finally, and most importantly, the message must originate with someone who is both credible and trusted. Those who teach forgiveness as a solution to taking offense must live a lifestyle that models this behavior. Social psychologists are already recognizing the power of forgiveness, not only in our interpersonal relationships, but in organizational psychology and cultural affairs. It's not easy to forgive. If it was, perhaps humankind would be more successful at eradicating the kinds of social problems that taking offense can cause, and the world would not be in the state it's in today. Forgiveness is intimately intertwined with kindness, such that it's hard to separate the two. But being kind does not mean letting others get away with their wrongdoing. Forgiving others does not mean that you are letting someone off the hook. It means that you are moving the guilty person from your hook to God's hook, or to some other hook, such as the legal system, karma, or the arc of the moral universe as it bends toward justice. It's not our job to punish our transgressors, and we probably wouldn't be very successful trying to make them pay anyway. 
Remember, forgiveness doesn't mean inviting all those who have hurt you to a dinner party and trying to reconcile with them. Here's a great quote about forgiveness. I've seen it attributed to several people, so I'm not sure where it originated. Harboring unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping your enemy will die. I hope that I've persuaded you to give forgiveness a try.